Hello, my name's Professor Alan Mackey and I'm the Head of Food Science and Nutrition at the University of Leeds. And it falls to me to present this taster lecture on the design of healthier foods. And in this lecture, we're going to cover some exemplar material of the kind of thing that you might cover in your lectures if you study in the school at Leeds. We all know what food is, and here we can see some examples. Of course, we've all been consuming it all of our lives, so we know a lot about it, or at least we think we do. So what is food really, and how does it link to health? Food is any substance consumed to provide nutritional support for an organism. Historically, humans secured food through two methods, hunting and gathering, where we ran around after animals to kill them, or we roamed the surrounding area in order to gather anything that we thought might be edible. This involved a lot of energy expenditure. Subsequently, we got tired of walking so far and we developed agriculture. So we didn't allow animals to roam as widely and we gathered plants that we'd planted ourselves so we knew where they were. This involved less energy expenditure. Of course, today, the majority of food required by the world is supplied by the food industry. And this involves even less energy expenditure on our part as the only hunting and gathering we do is in the aisles of the local supermarket. Food and health have long been known to be linked to one another. And in particular, if you look down any high street, it has become apparent that the rate of obesity is still increasing. And although we may not be world leaders here, so countries such as the USA and Mexico are still well in advance of us, the UK has nothing to be proud about as we're leading the way in Europe, as a French colleague of mine is continually pointing out. Of course, the solution is easy because we know what the cause is. Energy in through eating, so the more energy we uh, consume, is greater than the energy out, i.e. the energy that we burn through resting metabolism and through exercise. So the simple answer is eat less, exercise more. But of course, there's more to it than that. So also linked to these are things like satiety and appetite and digestion rate, and that's linked to the composition of the food. Overall consumption of high calorie foods combined with stressful living conditions has caused a loss of equilibrium and led to overweight and obesity. However, research suggests that a plant-based diet containing low amounts of sugar, little red meat, and the minimum of fats promotes weight loss and prevents obesity and diseases linked to obesity such as type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, certain types of cancer and other things. Food has structures at multiple different scales and these can affect palatability and bioactive and nutrient release so we need to understand them. On the left here we see a molecular structure of a protein and these proteins can assemble into super molecular structures and aggregates and these in turn can come together to form cellular structures or multicellular structures as we can see from the picture of the plant cells and also uh, these then assemble into macroscopic structures in this case an apple that end up being bite-sized and that's the scale that we perceive the food and that the food um, is sold to us at. We need to understand how those food structures are then linked to release of nutrients. So where does digestion start? Of course, one can consider that digestion starts in the mouth, but in some senses it starts before that. So cognitive and sensory enhancement of satiety and enzyme secretion. And by cognitive, I mean thinking about the food can lead to the secretion of saliva and other enzymes in a Pavlovian response. But that's quite complex. And what we really need to think about 
is what happens subsequently. So let's assume that oral processing is really the first easily tractable part of digestion. And this is where aroma is released. We taste the food, we sense the texture. There is a certain amount of starch hydrolysis to generate a small amount of sweetness from starchy foods and where we chew to break down those cellular structures. Once we've chewed to form a bolus, that bolus is then swallowed and passes down the esophagus into the stomach. And gastric processing comprising things like proteolysis, so the breakdown of proteins, or lipolysis, the breakdown of lipids, and acidification occur. But actually, the stomach is mostly about storage and it has sensors that detect how full it is. So when the stomach is full, we feel full and we stop eating. Further down the stomach, gastric processing in terms of shearing and grinding further makes the particles smaller after chewing and the food then passes into the intestine. And intestinal processing combines proteolysis, lipolysis, by amylolysis and the breakdown of starch with a well mixed system and then the nutrients released are transported to the site of absorption where they're absorbed and av made available to the rest of the body. Also part of intestinal processing is nutrient sensing. So food is not just sensed in the mouth but all the way down the gastrointestinal tract. It's just that we're aware of the sensing in the mouth but not subsequently, not directly, because indirectly this nutrient sensing leads to hormone secretion, gastrointestinal hormones, and nerve links to the uh, appetite sensing regions and controls factors such as gastrointestinal motility, enzyme and bile secretion, and as I said, appetite. One of the early stages of digestion that we've just talked about, and the one that has a big impact on rates of digestion, is the gastric phase. So what happens in the stomach? How do we find out what is happening in the stomach? Can we see, for example, phase separation in the stomach? Let's see what we can First of all, here's an example of using MRI from a study that I did a few years ago. And in this sequence, you can see a series of vertical slices taken through the body, which allow us to look in detail at the contents of not just the stomach, but actually to see the location of all the other organs. So in this, we can see the stomach uh, at, the, uh, at the top here. You can see the bright region at the bottom, which is the bladder. You can now see the spine and you can see the kidneys on either side. So you can get a lot of detail. And from these, we can get uh, an understanding of what's happening in the stomach. What other methods might we use? We can also use a very small camera called a pill cam, and this is an image taken of an empty stomach uh, of a participant in a study. And after a little while, the participant drinks some milk. So this is why the image has gone white, because the participant has drunk milk. And we can see that initially the stomach was um, empty and you could see the folds of the stomach because it was a very small volume and then it expands to allow the uh, milk to take up the space in the stomach and you think okay we've just drunk some liquid milk uh, and now it's gone white and we're not going to see anything very interesting subsequently but that's not really true so after 80 minutes so more than an hour we can still see the white on the right hand side but we can now see the clear secretions and the stomach wall. And we can see a sharp boundary between those two. Now, if the milk is a liquid, why can we see a sharp boundary? Well, the answer is the milk is no longer a liquid. It's been turned to a solid. After 160 minutes, so getting on for three hours, we can still see large chunks of solid left behind in the stomach. And this is after consuming a glass of milk. So what has happened? Well, what's happened is that essentially we've made cheese and in the stomach we have the solid curd cheese um, left behind and the liquid whey part has passed out of the stomach into the small intestine. 
can we use this kind of phase separation to alter different factors through digestion? So in this example, we compared a liquid meal with a semi-solid meal with the same protein, lipid, and carbohydrate content. And the only difference structure, and the aim was to see whether the food structure could increase fullness and decrease hunger. And in this example, you can see the liquid meal in our participant on the left. And I've taken a fixed slice through the stomach of the participant lying down on their back. And you can see the light region is the stomach. And at the start, it looks very uh, homogenous. And then you see a gray line appear uh, in the stomach. And that's where the fat has floated to the top. And on the right hand image, you can see dark regions at the start of the sequence, and these are the boluses of food that were formed in the mouth and then swallowed, and they stay persistent for a while in the stomach. So we can get some information about what's happening in terms of the pictures. But of course, we're scientists. We're not just interested. We're interested in also the volume. So we measured the volume of the gastric contents from the two systems, from the liquid and the semi-solid meals. And you can see that the liquid meal emptied more quickly. And this led to differences in fullness. And so the uh, liquid meal gave less fullness. The semi-solid meal, people felt fuller. And subsequently, this had an impact on hunger. So the people who had consumed the semi-solid meal felt less hungry than the people who consumed the liquid meal. And bear in mind that they consumed exactly the same protein um, and lipid and carbohydrate and calories. The only difference was the structure of the meal. We've also looked at um, phase separation of um, different sorts of meals. So here we looked at the effect that porridge had when you controlled the size of the flakes. So we had porridge made from oat flakes on the left. Um, actually on both sides. And um, we uh, looked at what happened um, after we consumed both meals. So initially, the first thing that we noticed was that um, on the left hand side in the stomach, which you can see circled in white, um, there is a gray layer at the top and you can almost see individual flakes of oat uh, below that. And 20 minutes later, that gray liquid layer has been removed. So the liquid gets emptied first, even though it's sitting on the top. And that's important to remember. We also looked at whether there was any differences in the rates of gastric emptying for the two. And we discovered that there was no significant difference in the rates of gastric emptying. So we thought maybe this would give us uh, nothing interesting. But actually, when we started to look at the glycemic response in a little more detail, it became rather more interesting. So if we start with the glucose response, these are healthy individuals. And if you're a healthy individual, normally your blood glucose level is very well controlled. And you can see that that's true in this case, that the differences between the two groups were very small in the glucose graph. And that's because there were differences in the secretion of insulin, which controls blood glucose. So you can see there are differences between the two groups in the amount of insulin that was secreted that help to control that blood glucose level. One of the gastrointestinal hormones, GIP, helps to control the amount of insulin that's secreted as a function of detecting glucose in the small intestine. And you can see in that, because it's sensing the glucose in the small intestine, or at least absorption of glucose from the small intestine more directly, you can see there were big differences in the uh, amount of hormone present, suggesting or indicating that there were big differences in the rate of release of glucose from the starch between the two different meals. So although you didn't see anything different in emptying, the behavior was significantly different. And it's these type, this type of detailed information that can help us understand the link between food and health. So in conclusion, we can say that food structure is complex. Food structure can affect digestion and risk factors for disease, such as cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancer, type 2 diabetes, etc. 
And we know that digestion kinetics is important because the kinetics controls the rate at which nutrients and bioactives enter the bloodstream and therefore the concentrations that can be maintained in the bloodstream. And we know that food structure and composition can be used to alter digestion kinetics. And that dietary fiber, as shown in the last example, can slow digestion. So where do we go next? Well, it's clear that a number of the approaches that we've been taking so far are not really working. We can advertise the fact that people should be exercising more and consuming less. And we've been doing that and governments have been doing that for a while. Um, and it doesn't really seem to be working. So maybe we should be thinking about health by stealth. So making foods that we're familiar with healthier or have a better impact on t in terms of our health. And if you've become a student at our school, you'll be helping to design some of those foods and we'll give you the training and expertise that you need for joining the food industry and helping to make our food healthier and our lives better and longer and with better quality. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy your time if you decide to come to Leeds, which I recommend you do. Thank you.